I'm investigative journalist Molly Barrows. For years, I've covered the stories that made headlines in Northwest Florida and all along the Gulf Coast. Murders. Missing persons. And mysteries of all kinds. These cases are far from over for many victims because the full story has yet to surface. Join me for Gulf Coast Confidential, where I dive into the saltier side of the South and expose the lies, greed, and corruption that often weighs down the truth. It's time to turn the tide and get a shot at justice. Hi, I'm investigative journalist Molly Barrows. I've been covering crime in Florida's panhandle for years, and welcome to Gulf Coast Confidential Conversations. Here we dive into the deep end and discuss what we can learn from a lot of the true crime cases I talk about on Gulf Coast Confidential. My co-host is Pam Hill. Her sister Sharon Adelot was murdered by her own son on Christmas Eve 2013, and she has a unique perspective on a lot of the crimes and scandals that we cover on Gulf Coast Confidential. She's a survivor of violent crime. She is also a grief and loneliness researcher, as well as a pharmacist. So, Pam, welcome, as always. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, and, and today we're talking about the tragic and heartbreaking case of Naomi Jones, mm. a 12-year-old from Pensacola, Florida. She was kidnapped and murdered by her neighbor. I mean, truly, every parent's nightmare. And if you're not familiar with the case, you can watch or listen to the episode Powerless on Gulf Coast Confidential, where I give the nuts and bolts of the case. And for those who aren't familiar, Naomi Jones was actually strangled to death on May 31st, 2017, by registered sex offender Robert Howard, who lived in the same apartment complex as Naomi's family. He saw an opportunity when she was home alone with her younger brothers, and prosecutors say he cornered her in his apartment with the intent of sexually assaulting her. He was convicted of choking the little girl to death and disposing of her body in a creek about four or five miles away from where they lived. And the story made big headlines in Pensacola at the time. So many people volunteered to look for that little girl in the days after she was reported missing and before her body was found. Pam, you were one of those who mm -hmm. helped in the search. Talk a little bit about that. What, yeah. Why you decided to take part? Uh, well, this was in 2017. Uh, my sister was murdered in 2013, and then my nephew had a hearing in 2016. So for years, I have been living with grief and questions and some heartache and hurt and betrayal. Like, why does this happen? Who does this stuff? But it happens to real people. So the center, my, my church, Olive Baptist, was basically the communication center where they set things up. I mean, it just looked like something off of the SWAT team off of TV. It was impressive. There were certain parts of our church we couldn't go in. Even when we had choir practice, I think they set up in the choir room. Anyway, it was, it, I couldn't not do it. Right. So uh, I would drive that way many, many times just in my regular days, and I would see it, and I just thought, okay, I I'm going to help because I felt like people didn't help me sometimes. A lot of people did, don't get me wrong, but just keep doing, doing. You know, that's my thing. Do something, seeing and saying, who cares? So I went up there. I went to regular ladies. We're out there with sticks, looking in dumpsters, looking on the brush and stuff, and I do not like snakes and even things, you know, like that. I just don't like all that. But I got down in the brush there, right there near Aspen Village, right near Whitmire Cemetery, right behind my church. And I said... And just for those folks that are listening and watching, that uh, is the apartment complex where Naomi lived with her family as well, part-time as the sex offender who who was convicted of killing her, Aspen Creek Apartments. Right. It's in the northeast part of Pensacola, um, sort of a place where that was more affordable for a lot of folks mm -hmm. who were maybe on a budget, but a very woodsy area, crisscrossed with mm -hmm. little swampy areas. Areas, little creek area, so that's why you yeah. were concerned about snakes. I was, yeah. I was, I was like, I, I was scared of snakes, and I, then I got mad, and I said, I wish a snake would, because I was thinking, I will twist its neck off. I mean, all kind of crazy wow. stuff went in my head, and that's the kind of stuff I was saying while I was looking, but I thought, please, God, just have let her walk away, or let her have gone to a friend's, or let her be disobedient, you know, but I she know. wasn't. She was a good little girl, and I have this little index card here to remind me, because this little girl... She would go spend her little monies at the dollar store and buy her little brother's index cards so she could teach them stuff. 
Oh my gosh, I know. What a sweetheart. She 12 was. years old. She was going to Ferry Pass Middle School yeah. and uh, her brothers, she was basically like a little mama to them yeah. too. She had a four-year-old uh, little brother named Jaden and she had uh, an older brother. He was 10 at the time, um, M- Emmanuel, yes, who yes. she was home alone with actually mm-hmm. because summer had just started. Her mom was working. In fact, she was working two jobs mm-hmm. and their grandmother was supposed to come over that day, but it was raining and she didn't want to get out in the rain. Um, but they both had called to check in on the kids mm-hmm. later that morning. Um, you know, mom sent a text, how are things going? And Naomi said, good. And that was the last time mm-hmm. they communicated. Mm-hmm. And then it was Emmanuel who, who called uh, their mom, you know, a couple hours later and said, Naomi walked out the door and never came back mm-hmm. and never did come back right. again. They said she went out to walk her little English yes. bulldog. She liked bulldogs. She liked Hello Kitty. She loved Hello Kitty. And I'll tell you a little more about that later. Um, but Hello Hello Kitty and making slime with glitter in it. Just look like like Vivian. I know, Your my daughter. Yeah. I know. She's 11, and I thought about that a lot when I was writing the mm-hmm. story, the nuts and bolts portion of the story, as well as thinking about what we were going to talk about for this. It's, it's hard for any parent, I think, to listen to the worst-case scenario, mm-hmm. what happens to a child. But I think it's important to talk about, not because of rehashing these gruesome details, which there are very many gruesome there are details. so many I can't even stand. Right. Some mm-hmm. of them we're not going to get into because no. it's just not necessary. Yeah. But it is necessary, I think, to discuss the situation because it is the truth. There are predators like this among us. They can be charming, some of them. You know, look at Jared from Subway. I yeah. watched a little bit of that oh documentary, too. And and there are recordings of, you know, him desiring children and, and, and having a need for them based mm-hmm. on his tone. And, and I think that's what we're looking at with Robert Howard. I think this was a man that didn't want to control himself. You know, when um, investigators narrowed him down as the main suspect during their search, they uh, looked into his background and realized that he had spent 15 years in prison in Alabama because he was convicted of raping two women in 1999, and one of them was just 19 years old. Yeah. So I think that uh, he had only been out of prison just a few years by the mm-hmm. time he killed Naomi. So, I mean, the punishment did not change him. He mm-hmm. was still the same monster that he was when he went into prison. He was probably refined his ways, if you will, but those desires, that, that need to attack children. I yeah. mean, it's a fiend. It's a fiendish mm-hmm. need. It's oh, evil. Yeah. It, it, we can't even wrap our head around it. No. And the, he was on the uh, sex offenders list in Alabama. Right. But he came down here and, for lack of a better word, and going to get all whatever uh, shacked up with his girlfriend here, yes. not putting himself on the lease. She didn't put him on the lease. That is why places like that ask you to tell somebody who's in your house and stuff. You can't just be having all these people coming and going. Uh, there's a mother next door with three children. And so he, Robert Howard, you know, he turned all this around on Naomi. He was the one that was watching teenage porn and all this other stuff and uh, buying erectile dysfunction medicine online and stuff like that. He went to a target-rich environment where mommies have to go to work. Her mother was working two jobs. And the, like you said, this was the rare occasion. Just And we've all, I mean, I'm of that age where when your mother told you, I've got to go to the store or something, you do not open this door for anybody. Right. Anybody well, except me. I'm of that age as a Gen Xer where you're home alone a lot. Oh. I mean, and I remember when there were landlines and people would do creepy cold calls and mm-hmm. you'd get strange calls. and. But yeah, I mean, every parent, I think, has that, you know, that's one of the issues that I thought would be important to touch on is just uh, the importance of accessibility to healthy and safe child care. Right. And especially when you are struggling, when you don't maybe have the resources like some families do, even when you do have the resources, finding somebody that you trust to watch your children can be Mm -hmm. tough. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, when the mom first realized that Naomi was missing, the brother had called, she came home from work, she was even more distraught when she realized that she left her purse and her cell phone there because she never went anywhere without her purse and a cell phone, which is, again, such a little girl thing to do. You're trying to be Mm -hmm. what a woman would do. You're trying to be a big girl. And, uh, and, And she was just so devoted to her brothers. And that's another thing that the mom had told police when she did call them to report that she was missing. She was like, this just doesn't make any sense. Not only did she leave her purse and her cell phone, but she would never go far from this apartment complex. She wouldn't leave her brothers, mm-hmm. and especially not the littlest one, who was right. four years old at the time, because the mom said that was her baby. Right. You know, and it's just, it's heartbreaking. And the brother was the one that called. So, you know, they canvassed the area. that The, the search really started in earnest the next day, which would have been um, June 1st. 
And then on June 2nd, there were so many people that were involved. You had state law enforcement, federal law enforcement, local police and sheriff's deputies as well. It was a, a Scambia Sheriff's Office investigation. Um, but an FDLE agent with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement was among those who was talking to neighbors and canvassing the neighborhood. And he talked to Robert Howard, who was mm-hmm. 38 years old at the time. And he made a note in his notes as he talked to him that there was – Uh, he kept changing his story, that there were some inconsistencies in his story. So it wasn't so much that they just immediately focused Mm -hmm. on him, but it was in the notes. Right. And so, exactly. again, they're mm-hmm. looking through all these. They're, they're checking out all kinds of leads. And uh, even the mom, and this is, again, going to the point of just what a little girl Naomi was. She said, you know, she's never run away before. We have a good relationship. I don't think that's what happened. But just in case, here's a list of her friends. Here's some of the boys she liked and talked to online. They went through her phone and just little girl stuff, nothing inappropriate. Mm-hmm. But, you know, her friends didn't know where she was. They even talked to another little girl who had, uh, you know, hung out with one of the boys previously that Naomi liked. And and there might have been a little, you know, tension between the two of them over this boy. Um, they even talked to her and she was upset saying, I would never do anything yeah. to her. And, oh. And it caused her stress. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's just the ripple effects of something like this. And this is before her little body was even found. But, um, you know, her mom said, well, when you're checking her friends, also check Dreamland Skate Center because she planned to go roller skating tonight. She loved that. You know, and Mm -hmm. I remember roller skating when I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. Going back to, you know, the Gen X era, it was during the summer. You just do the all day skate. Mm -hmm. Your parents would drop you off in the morning. You waited in line to get in and then (laughs) hung on to shag carpet walls around the, (laughs) at least I did, you know. <laughs> the, okay. re- the whole time in the rink, I really wasn't the best skater, but hey, it was air conditioned. It was mm-hmm. inside, and, and roller skating was just a lot of fun. And it, it's fun to be around other kids. Yes. And, and I think that's what they were hoping is that right. maybe she had just gone with her other friends. But I think that mom knew, the whole family knew immediately mm-hmm. something was wrong because it, she was mm-hmm. just such a responsible child. Right. And a they were hoping child. she would be disobedient. Isn't that something they're hoping? Well, and just FYI, old baby boomers did that too. <laughs> <laughs> like I to know. go skating and stuff. That was what we did, too. Oh, but, I've heard so, of these boomers. Yes, you speak here of. I sit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, poor little thing. Yes, they were hoping she had been disobedient, but that was exactly opposite. They said she was dutiful and she was responsible and she was kind and that um, the oldest brother is the one that that would watch out for her as well back and forth so yeah and I I think she had probably just gone out to walk her little doggy yeah I know and her mom had said if you do walk the dog y'all need to go together right but you know you just think it'll just take a second Mm -hmm. it'll just take a minute and apparently that's when she had her encounter with uh with Robert Howard and and just to describe that apartment complex it's basically two wooden sided buildings side by side They contain uh, eight apartments each, four on either side of the building. It's two stories, two on top, two on the bottom. And there's these wooden staircases that split the middle of each side Mm -hmm. of the building so that you can walk up and then take a left or take a right Right. to get to the apartments Mm -hmm. on either side. And so he lived in the same apartment complex with his girlfriend. And uh, he worked in Bruton, Alabama, which is a town about an hour north of Pensacola, just over the Alabama-Florida state line. He also called that home. So at one point when police start to narrow their investigation, focus more intently on him, realize he is a registered sex offender, but he wasn't registered in Florida. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting when they asked him, well, why didn't you register? He basically was playing dumb and saying, well, I didn't think I needed to. I don't Mm -hmm. live here. I don't work here. But, you know, you're staying here. And it's just more lies as we dig into this case. He does nothing but lie. Same. He's the biggest liar. He just lies, lies, lies on top of lies. But same reason he didn't go notify the management that he's on the lease. Right. Always trying to shuck and jive. Always trying to get away with something. It's always everybody else's fault. Isn't this a common thing in everything that we've talked about? Yes, it's this uh, complete lack of responsibility, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm no psychiatrist or mental health expert, but it just seems like it's, I'm sure there's all sorts of fancy terms for that sort of personality, yeah. but it yeah. seems like it's psych- psychopathic right. or well, sociopathic. Right. In this case, it's murderer is or, the term. Right. Or there's like some, you know, bad words that I could say. Yeah, you it's, could. It's bleep Polish, really, <laughs> you know, it. yeah. is what it is. Mm-hmm. It's just, just thinking totally of themselves and being... Mm-hmm incredibly self-centered. Mm-hmm. These are my needs that need to be met, right. this little girl. And right. that is consistent. And, you know, we you, we did talk a little bit about um, how he how he blamed her. But let's, before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about when they finally did find her body because mm-hmm. there were several days. I mean, Ugh. she now we know she was murdered on the 31st, but it was not until June 5th that her body mm-hmm. was actually found. There were just 
uh, masses of people that volunteered oh, yeah. to search. Among, yeah. Like you talked right. about that. All of Baptist Church was the staging point, your mm-hmm. church. Mm-hmm. It's huge. It takes up a, a big corner of a, of a big city block in northeast mm-hmm. Pensacola. Big parking lot, lots of resources. So it made, and it was just not too far from Aspen Creek Apartments. It so it made right a good, mm-hmm. you know, ground mm-hmm. zero for the search. Right. It, it was it was emotional, even just going to church there during that time, going to choir practice and going because we like I said, we couldn't go in the choir room. It, it, it that's when it hit me hard. It's like this is for real. She didn't run away. She's not just lost. This is scary. And I think I don't know how to say it exactly like Klaus kids. Yes, they were part of the yes. search, Klaus kids. Right. And they were very professional. Everybody was professional, like you see on TV and just calm but professional and at a certain point they asked the community to not be searching because other things that they had to do that only they know but you know it was intense and it was emotional and I prayed so hard every time I just drove by there and then I get home I couldn't stop thinking about her yes I mean it's triggering especially when you're grieving your own mm-hmm. loss and you've also experienced mm-hmm. violent crime and and any kind of loss whether it's something that's headline making like your sister mm-hmm. experienced and by default you experienced or if it's just losing my dad like yeah. I lost mm-hmm. my father to a medical reason but you know any kind of loss and then seeing that happen in your community to someone who is innocent and defenseless like a child it is triggering a little girl the deeper the pain I think the deeper um, it, the potential for a trigger it seems All right. like our grief the where there's a lot of love, there's a lot of grief. Yes, Mm -hmm. exactly. And so everybody was hoping and praying. They were participating in this search. Um, And, and, you know, police talked about what she had last been wearing, what she was Mm -hmm. last seen. And it was a a red tank top, and they described it as a camisole Mm -hmm. in the police reports, um, as well as a little white choker necklace, um, (sighs) uh, denim shorts that were the American flag, because, you know, it was just a month before. It was the beginning of summer. month Memorial Day. Right. And a month before July 4th. So she was looking cute. She had Nike slides on mm-hmm. and uh, and just like any typical little girl wanting to look her best wanting yeah. to be cute you mm-hmm. know and and she was and she was by all accounts very friendly very outgoing and again I described that apartment complex um, because it did make it easy for neighbors to run into each other and as I was reading through the police reports um, when the mom was talking to the deputy to initially report her missing and talking to other investigators they were basically asking is there anybody in this apartment complex that you suspect what do you think could have happened and nobody mentioned Robert Howard, mm-hmm. but, you know, the mom did say, well, there are a few neighbors that live in this one apartment, and, and they were a little too forward with Naomi talking to her, and she was carrying a laundry basket, and they made her so uncomfortable, she dropped the, the laundry basket and ran back to the apartment. Mm-hmm. So what I took away from that is, here's a little girl who's got some common sense, who isn't just so, you know, she, mm-hmm. she did run away from what she perceived as a dangerous situation, right. which goes to show you that Robert Howard knew how to charm her. Mm-hmm. He knew how to to get around that natural defense system that she had um, because I think that's what investigators found. Again, talking about how wide open she goes down to walk the dog. He probably sees an opportunity. Um and she compliments his shoes. So it sparks a conversation. The next thing you know, he's manhandled her. He's got her in his apartment. Um, according to the police reports, when they were asking crime scene to go in, this was after her body was found, to go into his apartment um, and, and, and test for places. This was actually actually after he had confessed. Um, they asked the, them to check the area on the side of the front door. So basically he had her, it sounded to me like he had her pinned against mm-hmm. the wall and they were looking for any kind of, mm. you know, DNA evidence that would confirm mm-hmm. that. But they did find um, in the bathroom, like a corner of the bathtub tested positive for blood. I don't know if that mm-hmm. turned out to have anything to do with her death, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little yeah. bit about that. So, you know, it was June 5th when they found her body and it was the worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. It was not what everybody was expecting or praying for, or hoping for the, the safe return of the this little girl, um, but two men looking to fish, looking for a spot to fish, had uh, peeked over this bridge um, where he had placed her body and dumped her body is a better way to put it. Yeah. It just hurts my heart to think of that. But um, so they look down and they see her lying. They see what they thought actually was a deer, a dead deer. A little deer. That's right, mm-hmm. on in the creek bed below because she was face down. Um, and then when they got a closer look, they realized that it was a, a little girl body. And it was such a headline-making case, and I thought it was poignant that when I was reading the officer's report who first arrived on scene before he handed it over to investigators, he made a note in his uh, in his report that one of the fishermen turned to him as they were looking from the bridge above and looking down. He goes, it's her, isn't it? 
Mm-hmm. You know, because everybody knew. Yeah, and you know, during this time, before he dumped her body like trash, before he did that, he had taken Naomi from where he killed her. I imagine he said he choked her out. You know, and but first he said that she had come on to him, tried to grab at his shirt and touched his genitals, and he just couldn't help it. He just had to choke her out because he's making she's making him feel. All kind of way. He was mad that she wouldn't leave. Yeah, what he told that's what the he said too. Yeah, but then, at, but then he drives her body up to Brute and trying to figure out what to do with her. Then comes back and has to come back to Pensacola. He makes quite a few trips back and forth. But then he decides he's going to go right there by that bridge, Eight Mile Bridge. Yeah, I think is what they call Eight it. Eight Mile Creek. Yeah, yeah and they right. call it Eight Mile Bridge. Right. And it's right there by a big, looks like mega church mm-hmm. right there. And uh, it's kind of open. It looks like a new bridge. And he just decides, well, this will do because he said he was stressed out. He didn't know what to do. He had to get rid of her body. He knew it was starting to smell or stink. It was in the back seat of his car. Yeah, he just rode her all around. I know. That was so disturbing. Um, and so, and, and police had all kinds of evidence. So, you know, again, they start when they found her body and they realized that it's foul play. And they could tell even at the, at the scene, there were injuries to her genitals. There were injuries to her neck and her throat. There were other injuries on her body that indicated to them that it was foul play. And right. when they did the autopsy, they found that that was certainly confirmed. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did take swabs of her genital area. Mm-hmm. But uh, it appears that they never could conclusively say if he assaulted her because he had dumped her body in the water, in the water. and because there had been yeah. advanced decomposition, basically right. the elements, it was hot, she yeah. was in the water. In the, and in the in the car. I mean, it, it, it was brilliant if he meant it, you know, but he didn't. Right. And, you know, the, this guy, he just lies, lies, lies. Robert Howard, he just lies all the time. Well, the one thing he was curious about, because for some reason he has to distance himself or act like, it's her fault again. Mm-hmm. He goes, did she still have uh, the candy in her mouth? You know, yes, because they found that in autopsy, the mm-hmm. piece of gum was just still in her yeah. mouth. So just a little girl yeah. and duct tape in her hair. Yes. So my question is, if you choked her out and she was coming on to you, and you're a big old man, she's 97 pounds, right? In a little tank five top, foot one, yeah, little little bitty girl, girl, and you choked her out because y- you can't control yourself. She's making you feel some sort of way. What's duct tape got to do with it? Right. I know. That's disturbing. But, you know, that is consistent. I've seen other interviews, um, clips of investigators talking to to suspects and then, in many cases, people that were later convicted of molesting children and and seeking them out. And to a one, they all turn it on to the kid. They all say this this child, you know, needed the attention or, or, you know, she the way she was sitting, I knew she wanted me to touch Mm -hmm. her or the way she was playing. And it's just so sick. It's again, it's just this twisted mentality of it's not me, it's yeah. Normal people do not think like that. No, and normal people, I mean, if you were to have a thought like that, you just need to immediately banish Go, it from yeah, your thought and get yeah. some help. Oh, the doctor. You know? yeah, right. Because, but, I mean, like, this is consistent. People just always blaming the child or the woman or the weaker yes. person. They Nobody's responsible anymore. Well, I, I, he's responsible 100%, and I'm, I cannot tell you how glad I was when they found him and put it put what he did on him. I know, I know. And it was interesting because, you know, at the time, uh, state attorney Bill Eddins was in that office and he told the community that that Howard, when he was arrested and charged for this crime, he was charged with first degree murder and kidnapping, that he would face the death penalty. But um, that was in 2017. But it was years before it actually went to trial. Mm-hmm. It, you know, he didn't mm-hmm. go to trial until 2021, in part because of COVID delays. Right. But by that time, they took the death penalty off the table. Right. And they said it was, quote, unquote, not appropriate yeah. based on evidence and that they had discussed it with her mother. And she was OK with, you know, if he was convicted to pursuing life in prison without the possibility of parole, mm-hmm. which is what happened. That's Good. what yeah. he got. So he's actually uh, serving out that sentence at a at a prison close to home, the Santa Rosa Annex Mm -hmm. in Milton, Florida, which is also in the panhandle. Um, But yeah, it it was just interesting to me that, that, you know, here he has been staying with this girlfriend. He denies that he actually lives there, but he, you know, and just some of the comments that he made about Naomi would indicate that he had been watching her. And there were other kids around there too, Mm -hmm. you know, and it makes you wonder what close calls they may have had. You know, when I pass by there going back and forth to church or back to the Target and all that kind of stuff, I would think, oh, this kind of dangerous kid, this is too close to the street, Mm -hmm. is what I would think. You know, because, like, uh, that's the back way out of Olive Baptist. There's a lot of traffic. It's Johnson Avenue right there. Yes, it's busy. Yeah, it's very busy. And I remember thinking, oh, you know, because the garbage cans are real close to the road. I knew that place, but little, little did I know that I would know 
that about that place. I know. I know. It's horrific. Um, and, and it was interesting, too. So he, he does get convicted. He is sentenced. And, uh, and and both the mom and the brother spoke at the trial. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, she talked about how he, he Christmases and birthdays are never the same. Mm-hmm. That He took the, the missing puzzle piece of their family that will never be replaced. Mm-hmm. And the brother also spoke. And he was 14 by that time. Mm-hmm. And he got up and he said, you know, basically, who do you think you are? You're not a man. Yeah. And he I'm not my scared 12 of year old sister and I'm not scared right. of you. And you know what? That victim impact statement that people make, I'll have to tell you in Sharon's case, the victim impact statement was the most powerful I've ever felt in my life. I felt like I kicked the winning field goal for the Super Bowl because I got to talk to you about my sister and the proper story and this, that, and the other. You don't get a chance to really say anything to the offender. What are you going to say? The things that they've done are terrible. But the way that trials are and the way that uh, publicity... The process and, yeah, works. The process is all for the offender. What about his rights? What, well, you know, a person has the right to live. What about their rights? Their family has the right to enjoy them and this, that, and the other. But I tell people all the time, if you get a chance to do a victim impact statement, do it. I've even helped people write theirs before. I've gone to their house and done it for them because you never get that opportunity again. And that's what right at that moment is when I decided I am my sister's voice and her fight is my fight. Her brother, what's his name? Emmanuel. 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 He's awesome. I want to meet him. He stood up there and yeah, who do you think you are? killing my sister. Who do you think you are? You're not a real man. Who do you think you are? I'm not afraid of you. Right. Good for him. I know. He will change lives. Staring down the monster. Yeah. Good for him. I agree. But yeah, it is. And you bring up a great point about the victim's impact statement because on this podcast, as well as others that we do um, and plan to do, including Better Said Than Dead, it is about giving victims a voice. That's been a passion of mine my entire reporting career Mm -hmm. because people who... Even if you can't change the outcome, you can't bring somebody back who's been murdered. You can't change a crime that's already happened, but you can empower people who've experienced crime because it does leave you feeling helpless so many of the times. It leaves you feeling powerless, which is why I called the story of Naomi Jones, the nuts and bolts version, powerless. Right. Because she is little. You're just going through your life. You're five foot one, 97 pounds. She had pink nail polish on. That that stuck out to me when they were doing her autopsy. They were Mm -hmm. making various notes and they said pink nail polish was on all of her fingers fingers and mm-hmm. toes. Very much a little girl. Sweet you know? little thing. Right. I, I can just picture her. I can picture her out there just walking her little bulldog and her little brothers are inside. She knows she's just going to be out there for a second. She's mm-hmm. just going to let the dog do what the dog needs to do and go back in. And he saw her. Yeah. And he saw her alone. Yeah. And she complimented his shoes, mm-hmm. be doing what a little girl yeah. normally does, just like painting her, mm-hmm. you know, her, her fingernails and toenails pink, just like wearing her cute little summer outfit, mm-hmm. just like, you know, taking care of her brothers, enjoying Hello Kitty, enjoying making glitter slime. Mm-hmm. These are just natural behaviors of a little kid and these predators, these pedophiles, these mm-hmm. monsters use the very thing that makes them wholesome and innocent against them. They take that trust and they twist it. They take that friendliness and they use it against them, not just in murdering her, not just in taking her life, Mm -hmm. but then also when he's talking to the police and he's telling them she brought this on herself. It wasn't my perverted behavior. It wasn't my desire for her. It was her. She Mm -hmm. did this. And, And I think that's what is so important about those victim impact statements, whatever the crime may be, it gives them a chance to get up there and and look their accuser in mm-hmm. the face. And when they're denied that opportunity, like you think about Jeffrey Epstein, mm-hmm. how he committed suicide. And I know oh, there's yeah. a big debate about whether or not he actually did, but it, let's just say that that's true. Mm-hmm. What, either way, he's dead. Right. And the victims didn't have a chance to really confront him face to face. And I think that's why it was so powerful. And not when, you know, Giselle or Gazelle was... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, tried his, his partner in crime, right. if you will, because they had a chance to, she was part of that team mm-hmm. that groomed and brought those girls mm-hmm. into that, you know, human trafficking lifestyle, if yeah. you will. Um, and you saw it with the Duggars case as well. The 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 women that had tried to, to sue, you know, and, and basically that case was thrown out against the, the guy who was in charge of that 
particular organization, the one who molested them mm-hmm. um, initially. And so they got a chance to, to, even though that case was thrown out, he countersued. And then that opened the door for them to go into the court and talk to the judge about what he had done. Right. And not only was his case thrown out, but he ended up having to, you know, have some accountability. They 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 won and, and they won not just in the court of law, but they won because they were heard. Right. You were heard. Right. And Naomi Jones' family was mm-hmm. heard. And he's got to sit there in prison and watch his back. But it's yeah. nothing new to him. Yeah. He'd already spent 15 right. years in prison. And that's okay. He's where he needs to be. And also for Naomi, uh, there was a celebration at yes. our church in the parking lot that oh, I don't wow. know who put it on, but I went to that as well. When you're grieving and then you're in um, acute grief and then chronic grief and disenfranchised grief, you know, it's like when you're talking about my sister was murdered, people immediately get uncomfortable. Naomi was murdered. Her mom has to say, my daughter that was kidnapped and molested and murdered. Mm. People can't take it. I mean, you say, I lost somebody, which losing anybody's hard, but nobody, polite society doesn't talk about these things. And that's why we're talking about, sometimes I wince at the stuff we talk about. I know. You know, I really do. I used to wince. I just don't even think about it anymore, really. It's just part of the, part of the job, but it's what I... Because it's about helping people heal yeah, and helping yeah. them be heard helps them heal. Yeah. Well, you, I've seen you. I've seen you. You get emotional. Oh, definitely. Things, and you connect. And I think that's yes. why you do so well at this. Because I was looking for someone to help me tell the truth and to be Sharon's voice and my family's voice. So, I mean, helping people, like, your healing starts the moment you're heard. Yes. And it is interesting. I think it's... Uh, I, I didn't even realize when I started out on my reporting journey that I was going to end up doing so many cases where I tried to give people a chance to be heard and and, and, and tell, because I was on the courts and crime beat for so long. So as a result, I was always looking to tell the human side of the right. story. And that's the impact that it has, whether you agree with what happened or not, whether you agree with somebody being guilty or not, or, or whether you agree with a victim, you know, quote unquote, bringing it on themselves. Mm-hmm. Either way, the their reality is their reality. Right. And I remember years ago, a prostitute was murdered. And it turned out she was murdered by a man that they suspected was the, you know, a serial killer in the making, if you will, that he had, Mm -hmm. they suspected him of killing another woman. They never could prove it, but based on his behavior and what they saw, they felt like he was going to be a serial killer. But anyway, I remember reaching out to the family of this, this woman who had been murdered and she was on the streets. Uh, Prostitution was how she paid her drug bills, which is very, very common. Mm -hmm. She was, it was the addiction of the behavior of an addict and, uh, the family, you know, I called and, and it was her uncle on the phone and he was just, you know, not everybody wants to talk, but he wanted to talk. A lot of people do want to talk, mm-hmm. even if they don't necessarily want to be on the record. And I remember being on the phone with him sitting there in the newsroom and uh, he just, you could hear the catch in his throat. And he goes, Molly, I just don't know what to say. He goes, she was such a good girl. I watched her grow up and I hate that she got addicted to drugs, but she did not deserve this. She wasn't trying to put herself in this kind of harm's way. And he goes, and it breaks my heart to hear people talking about a prostitute being killed. Mm -hmm. He goes, because it it takes away, you know, the humanity of her. It Mm -hmm. labels her Mm -hmm. and it puts her in this box. And I, I remember just telling him, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. She deserves coverage just like mm-hmm. everybody else. Yeah. She deserves someone to cry and grieve over her. She deserves to have her case investigated. Mm-hmm. She deserves the the honor and the love and the recognition that you're giving her. And who cares what other people think? Yeah. Right. You know. Well, she didn't. Addiction, we have to be real careful about that. Addiction and the things that go with it. Addiction's a disease, you know, and we have kind of in our mind created this car wash type of thing with addiction. Dirty attic. You go in a dirty attic and you come out a clean recovery. Or you person. brought it on yourself right. somehow. But actually, the disease of addiction is a disease of not being connected. And then some people connect wrong. So, yes. I mean, it's we don't go slap people around that have smoked and have COPD or that have diabetes. We don't go yell at them about cookies and stuff. We help them. Right. We give them medicine. We give them counsel. We even have educators to come help with all that stuff. We have gotten so hard-assed about things, especially emotional things. And we have to love people where they're at. Right. And mental illness, and I, I have a kind, open 
tender heart toward mental illness. I do not believe that it instantly equals insanity or forensic behavior or a license to kill. Right. There's a fine line there. I don't like that being thrown on the mental illness side. But with mental illness, we have to love people through this. And you're still a woman. You're still a man. Nobody in the world should have to ask for a seat at the table of humanity right. for any reason. Yes, but you're right. And then I think even in that one phone call, even though he didn't want to do an on-camera interview and be included in the story, just that conversation enabled him to be heard. He knew I was going to be reporting the story and yeah. we did connect, you know, yeah. he felt better just having talked about her mm. in a loving way and having yes. been heard and realized that I wasn't one of those people that was getting ready to report on the prostitute right. who was killed. What a I was gift. going to report on yeah. her, the person. Mm. What a gift. Yes. And, I, and it, it wasn't an intentional gift. Yeah. I mean, but it did. Mm -hmm. It was a I've never forgotten it because it was just one of the beginning of one of many, many moments where I think people who've experienced that it, it, it can be as simple as just listening and not 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 labeling people, not judging, not judging. Judgment is like the furthest thing from love, basically, yeah. to me. Yeah. And it's interesting, too. You know, we talk about uh, I, now in a case like Robert Howard, I don't mind judging. Yeah. You know. Well, you're making an assessment. He, right. He he provided the facts. Yes. And, and, and you know, and the facts are that he lied. He he knew darn good and well mm -hmm. that he was living there. And uh, and in fact, Naomi Jones's mother, Shantara Hurry, um, filed a lawsuit against the company that was managing that apartment complex. Mm -hmm. um, and according to the Haggard law firm, which handled the suit, basically they did it over, you know, lack of security mm -hmm. that they should have uh, been there to monitor people who were off lease. And mm -hmm. she ended up getting a $2 million mm -hmm. settlement out of that, which is good because yeah. I think, you know, there is a lot of criticism about you know, people who file lawsuits, I think, and, and I think a lot of times it's unfair mm -hmm. because our system is not set up to give people a chance to be heard, yeah. whether it's criminal right. justice or civil mm -hmm. court as well. But people do pay attention when you hit them in the pocketbook. Right. Oh, no, you hit people where they live. And I do feel like there are some people, not necessarily in our system, they may work within the system, but like m myself, my family, we have one of the, probably the best victim advocates that anybody could have. Gail, she's been she's been through this journey with me for nine and a half years. Gail will, Williams, mm -hmm. yeah, with the state yep. attorney's yep. office. She will be, it will be 10 years that she's listened to me cry, cuss, get mad, pound the table, fall on the floor, anything. But she always made me feel heard and she never judged me. Yes, I know. It's important. And I tell you what, um, it's important to, to not only be heard, but also to listen to your instincts. And mm -hmm. in this case, you know, you can't, what are some, you know, you can't necessarily predict evil in your life mm -hmm. or even recognize right. it when people are trying to hide it. And that's what Robert Howard did. But what are some of your takeaways from this case, Pam? The takeaway from this case is to trust your instincts. And, you know, moms and dads can't help it that they have to work. But my takeaway is that uh, the with, with this case, the apartments should have done better. They should have made sure people were on the lease. You can see whose cars are everywhere I've ever lived. Even if somebody came over to visit or something, you know, they know. But, I mean, it's not like top security everywhere. I get that. But to also, you know, she was an obedient girl. It was, she's a girl. She can't, she, we can't tell Robert Howard, hey, quit being a pervert and quit being a nasty man and quit right. being the criminal you are. But other grown-ups saw this behavior in him. See something, say something, do something. Don't jump in bed with him. Right. And that was my takeaway as well. Yeah. You know, we're all going to be in vulnerable positions, whether we realize it or not, just right. by the nature of life itself. And and unfortunately for Shintara Hurry, her children were in a vulnerable position and she had no idea that mm -hmm. they were living in the same apartment complex as a monster. But his girlfriend knew. She knew. And that's what I get upset about. She knew. And and she knew he wasn't on the lease. And he knew he wasn't on the lease. It's always the shuck, the jive, the flim flam, I'll get over on you, get the system, this, that, and the other. The system is there for a reason. I'm not saying you don't question authority or this and that, but just follow the rules. But people that are criminals don't do that. And then they want to whine and everything while they're in jail worrying about their rights. And you know that hits hard with me because my nephew wants to get out of a uh, the mental institution after killing my sister and still here we are talking about the offenders Naomi's dead Sharon's dead all the other victims are dead but we're here's our, our system is so backwards our system does not have judges that uh, are 
tough on crime. They're like, well, I don't want to get sued over him. It's like it's like that Dirty John series that I saw on Lifetime TV. I feel like my life is Dirty John. And when we get through writing this book, people will see that. Yes. And for those who aren't familiar with uh, Pam's sister's case, her name was Sharon Adelot. Again, she was murdered by her son, Brandon Adelot, in 2013 on Christmas Eve in the doorway of her home. You can hear more about that case in Mommy Killer. Pam and I talk about it um, in two episodes, in fact, Mommy Killer 1 and Mommy Killer 2. So you can find that on Gulf Coast Confidential Conversations. Um, And I also talk about it in Gulf Coast Confidential um, Murder and Madness. There's also Confessions in the Fieldhouse. There is a lot to Pam's Mm -hmm. story. And again, it's why she brings such a unique perspective to a lot of these crimes that we cover. And our hope is that not only will we give victims a chance to be heard, but we can bring up some of these issues that maybe other people can learn from as well. So I think that wraps it up for us. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Pam? Mm, I just would want to say what a precious little girl Naomi was. I know. I know. And her mom does post about her on Facebook. I know she posted about her on her 17th birthday, Aww. you know, last year. I, I saw that and talked about how this is your day. And I often mm-hmm. wonder about you yeah. and how tall you would be Aww. and what clothes you would like and what mm-hmm. TikTok dances yeah. you would be into. Um but I think that's too, that's that's tough. And I think you mm-hmm. can relate to that. Here we are talking yeah. about how her life ended and it was horrendous and heinous, but it is only a portion. Uh, it's not really about her.